Good afternoon, good evening and good morning to those of you tuning in from around the world to join us for this webinar on decarbonisation and shipping. The webinar is part of the London Shipping Law Centre's global webinar series and it's hosted today by law firm Hill Dickinson. My name is Rachel Hoyland. I'm a member of the London Shipping Law Centre's Education and Events Committee and one of the organisers of the event and I'm also a shipping lawyer at law firm Hill Dickinson. I therefore have the pleasure and honour of welcoming you today on behalf of both of these organisations. The London Shipping Law Centre was founded in 1994 by Dr Aleka Shepherd for the purpose of exchanging maritime, commercial and legal knowledge. Hill Dickinson is a law firm with over 200 years of maritime heritage, an international maritime practice and over 100 dedicated marine legal experts advising and supporting clients across the shipping industry around the world every day. I'm joined today by a fellow member of the LSLC committee, who is Grant Hunter, also Director of Standards, Innovation and Research at BIMCO, and an illustrious panel of experts, including Dr. Tristan Smith, Anne Chazelle, and Peter Eckhart, who will introduce themselves later. Uh, we're also due to be joined by Beth Bradley, one of my colleagues. Beth unfortunately can't make it today, so you'll actually be hearing more from me later as a panelist as well. Now, a few small points of housekeeping before we get on to the interesting discussions that are going to follow. Please note that your cameras and microphones are automatically switched off and we'd be grateful if you could leave them that way. We would like to hear from you, though, if you have any questions, so please submit those via the chat box. Please be aware that this session is being recorded and the link to the recording will be circulated afterwards. And if you'd like to give us some feedback, we'd be very pleased to hear that. Now, a few of the topics tabled for discussion today include the accommodation of uh, clauses in charter parties to deal with new regulations for shipping, the role of emissions data and data sources, whether radical rewriting of the contract will create competitive advantages, collaboration, and how to address the gap between corporate aspiration and day-to-day -day operations. So I think it's going to be a fascinating conversation. I'm particularly pleased that I now have an opportunity to be part of it. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Grant to take things forward. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Rachel, and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, thank you very much indeed for inviting BIMCO here today to uh, moderate this, uh, as Rachel says, very interesting discussion on uh, what is undoubtedly a very, very hot topic for the industry, and not surprisingly, will probably remain a very hot topic for the industry for many years to come. This is really quite significant stuff that is impacting on our industry. Um, and it's really something that we need to study in great detail. So I'm going to start off um, just by giving a little bit of sort of a background status on, on uh, the where we are in terms of global decarbonisation and the mandate uh, that's been given to the industry. Let me just pull up a slide here. So global decarbonisation mandate. Back in 2021, just last year, the IMO's uh, Marine Environmental Protection um, Committee uh, adopted amendments to the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships, better known as MARPOL and Annex 6, and introduced requirements uh, for ships to reduce their greenhouse gases. Now, these amendments uh, combine both technical and operational approaches to improve uh, overall the energy efficiency of ships. Uh, these uh, MARPOL amendments will come into force just actually later this year, 1st of November 2022, but the actual requirements to comply with them uh, won't take effect until the following year from 1st of January onwards. Uh, in terms of CII, which I'll talk about in a, a few minutes, uh, the actual reporting for that is sort of done in arrears. You gather data for a year and then the following year you're actually given an assessment and a rating. So uh, the first ratings will come out in 2024 and not 2023. OK, like all new legislation, it breeds a whole new set of abbreviations for us to learn. And uh, this one from on MARPOL is no different. Uh, I'm quite sure if many of you have heard of EXI, CII, ETS. These are all words and phrases and abbreviations that are being bandied around our industry and in the press. Uh, what do they actually mean and what do they actually stand for? So over the next few slides, I'm just going to explain a little bit about uh, each of these three abbreviations here. I've given them sort of uh, subtitles, the EXI, the one-off case, 
um, because it just applies to a, a single certification. CII, the game changer, because I really believe that, that is the one that's going to have the greatest impact on our industry uh, in ways that will unfold during our discussions here. But it is very, very significant indeed the way that uh, perhaps moving forward, um, owners and charters will need to conduct their business. So uh, it's a very significant one indeed. And then finally, looking at ETS, the emissions trading systems, uh, trading with uncertainty, I've, I've classed that as because uh, fundamentally we're focused at the world's largest sort of trading sector, which is the EU uh, and the scheme that they plan to introduce very shortly as well. But the legislation isn't yet finalised. Uh, the thing for the industry is we need something in our contracts to address if it's going to come into force early next year. Um, people are already fixing ships uh, on time charges that extend beyond the 1st of January 2020, 2023. How do we actually address that in our contracts? So it's something that needs to be dealt with as well. So EXI, the one-off case, uh, what actually EEXI stands for is Energy Efficient Efficiency Existing Ship Index. So this is designed for ships that are already on the water. There is a, a different index for new building ships, EEDI. Um, so this one just applies to ships that are already there. Uh, we would consider this to be sort of an entry level into the new MARPOL regulations. It sort of gets you into the game and the CII is the thing that allows you to stay in the game. So this is basically uh, a one-off uh, certification thing and it's a technical design measure so basically uh, you get certified for this once you put certain things in place it takes effect from the 1st of January um, it's not all all ships all at the same time all on the 1st of January so a, a rolling out of this certification process it will basically take place um, on or after the 1st of January coinciding with the ship's next special or annual survey so it won't add to all ships all overnight or will be rolled out uh, during the early part of 2023. Now, I guess one of the significant things for this is what will actually happen to ships? What does it mean for ships? We've um, heard probably in the press a lot about modifications that may be made, made uh, to ships in order to get their EXI certification. Uh, the reality is for more modern ships that are only a few years, they probably won't need to do any modifications whatsoever. They're already uh, falling within uh, the uh, the parameters of being an efficient ship so it wouldn't require any modifications for older ships uh, we think what will happen most likely is that a, a slight modification will be need to be made to the ship's uh, power output that'll either be through uh, the uh, putting on a, an engine limiter, limiter or um, a shaft power limiter as well so one of these these two methods will probably be the most likely thing that happens it's not a significant thing you don't have to go to dry dock to get this done it's a, from what we understand it's a relatively straightforward process to put sort of a governor or a limiter uh, on on these on the engine output to control it what will it mean for these ships it, people often talk about well we're here we're essentially talking about reducing the speeds of ships as we reduce the speeds even marginally we get a significant decrease in emissions and what we imagine for most ships it may be in the region of like half a knot reduction in speed in order to get their EEXI certification so it's not a dramatic reduction in speed to meet these efficiency measures but there will be a reduction in speed um and that may imply um, contractually uh, to a change in the speed of consumption warranties. It may not in all cases, it may be that the ship is already operating below its sort of maximum speeds and therefore by taking half an off at the, the top end, it's not going to have an impact on those warranted speeds. But it is something that people need to be aware of and something they need to look at uh, when we go through this process next year. CI, it stands for the Carbon Intensity Indicator. It's not a technical measurement, it's an operational measure. Um, and again, like EXI, uh, it will take effect after uh, the 1st of January 2023. Uh, it's a measure of the ship's efficiency based on CO2 emissions per cargo carrying capacity and nautical mile. The significance of CII in terms of measuring efficiency and emissions output for the industry is that it's not simply a case of just complying with CAI on uh, you know, the 1st of January 2023, and then as long as you maintain whatever you did to get compliance, you will remain in compliance. Unusually, this, what this legislation requires is that year in, year out, the thresholds for compliance, the thresholds within which you can uh, make your CO2 emissions in order to maintain a specific rating, get narrower and narrower. So what this means that if you have a ship that's sort of you know A or B rated um, to begin with, and let me just show the emissions level here. So say we start with a B rated ship, two years later, if you've done nothing to spot the carrier and operating that ship, just so you may drop to a C rating because the thresholds have actually narrowed. So it's very, very unusual whether this legislation will, will take uh, effect on the industry. And we're introducing this concept of continuous improvement uh, in terms of making the ships more efficient over time. 
The ratings you see on the screen here, uh, C rating is probably the one that most uh, ship owners will be looking to find their ships categorized as. Um, A and B are obviously the, the top performing, the most efficient ships there. Um, the CI rating will be impacted on lots of factors. It's not simply about slowing down your ship uh, to maintain your rating. You may look at reducing cargo intake. Um, it may be that you're impacted by delays in port may be impacted by uh, delays in bad weather. Even when you're sitting at anchor, you're going to be having some sort of emissions and all of these are taken into account. So all of these, these factors can have an impact on your CI rating. The way the system operates is that um, you gather your emissions data over a calendar year and then the following year, in March of that following year, an assessment is made and a rating is given based on the emissions you made in the previous year. So the significance of that is, is that during that trading in any one calendar year, it may be that your emissions go up and down depending on what voyages you're involved in, the length of the voyages, the cargo you're carrying, the weather or the delays you're, you're facing. It doesn't actually affect your rating in that calendar year. It will only be in the next calendar year when the assessment is made that that rating may change. If you go from a C rating to a D rating three years in a row, uh, you will have to submit a plan uh, to your flag state saying how you're actually going to get yourself back up to a C rating again. If you're rated as an E, you must so submit a plan immediately in order to show how you're going to address the situation. Interestingly enough, at the moment, there are no sanctions for failing to comply with the CII system. Um, Simply, there, there isn't anything in place for the first three years from 2023 to 2026. All we really have is these narrowing of threshold margins for uh, CO2 emissions, but there are no sanctions if you fail to comply. All we have, really have here is this obligation to uh, submit a, an updated report, an updated plan, should you uh, drop your ratings here. So uh, again, it's quite unusual legislation from that point of view. In 2026, the IMO plans to review uh, the regime. Uh, maybe at that point, it, it could be that they introduce some sort of sanctions, but certainly they will be reviewing the whole system after three years or so and introducing further narrowings of the, the thresholds for emissions for ships. Then we come to the last one, the ETS system, the emissions trading schemes. Uh, for the industry, uh, the main focus is on the EU system, the European Union um, emissions trading system. That is an existing system. I think it's been around since sort of 2004, applying to all sorts of other industries, including the airline industry, but heavy industries as well. Uh, what the EU plan to do now is to make that existing system apply to shipping. Um, we don't know exactly what the final form of the legislation will be yet because that hasn't been decided. It's not due to be decided until June this year. Um, but again, we need to make plans for this. We need to have things in our contracts to say, how are we going to deal uh, with this emissions trading scheme, the payment of allowances that are essentially allowing you to trade on this, this cap and trade scheme? Who's going to pay for those allowances? Who's ultimately going to be responsible for them if they're not paid? Um, the EU seems to be working on the principle, uh, they call it probably uh, rather unkindly, the polluter pays principle, in which case we'd be pointing the finger at uh, the party that is hiring the services of the ship under a time charter, which would be the uh, obviously be the time of the charter in that particular case. So we would say that that's going to be the party that has to pay for the allowances in order to trade the ship in and out of uh, the European Union. Um, so the challenge for us at the moment is that the legislation isn't in place, but we need to put something in our contracts to deal with it. What do we actually put in there? What's going to be fair and balanced and reasonable? How do we put the safeguards in place uh, to make sure the allowances are appropriately transferred? So uh, it's, it's, it's an important issue as well, and that's also something that we need to address in the industry. So we have a panel here today, a panel of experts that are all going to look at these issues from a slightly different perspective. Um, and what we wanted to do today was to have one overarching question that we ask each of the panel members, and then they will give their perspective on it or, or on how they, they feel about these particular issues. And the question that we want to ask the panel is that in response to the global decarbonisation mandate for shipping, what, in your view, is the general direction of travel and the contractual and commercial realms, because it has a, an impact on, on both here. So we're going to be asking uh, Peter, Ann, Tristan, and now Rachel, who's, who's stepping in, uh, these questions one by one. We're going to ask them to introduce themselves and then give their perspective on that particular aspect. Um, 
the first person I'm going to turn to is, is Peter, and we're going to ask him his perspective on data in, in, the, in the context of this question as well. Uh, data is very much sort of seen as the, the new gold in the industry, so Peter will give his perspective on that. Uh, then Anne will look at the trading of the ship on sort of the commercial aspects. Uh, Trist, Tristan will look at the misalignment of incentives for owners and charterers in relation to this legislation. And then Rachel will look at the concept of uh, radical contract revision. Are we looking at sort of a, a different way of doing business in the industry because of this new legislation? So I am now going to turn. Let me just switch my slide off. So I'm now going to turn to uh, Peter Eckhart, and uh, Peter I, I know very well because he's uh, on the FIMCO's documentary committee and he also currently heads up the Carbon Clauses subcommittee because we are actively trying to find uh, com uh, contractual solutions to deal with all of these uh, complex issues, not least CNI, CII, which we've been racking our brains out to find a solution for quite some time now. Uh, so Peter's kept very busy uh, on this particular aspect. Uh, Peter is the Managing Director at Martini Chartering. Um, so that's, uh, I, I guess, Peter, that's the broking aspect, but you're also the ship owner representative on, on this as well. So that, that's kind of the, the angle you're coming from. So what we'd like you to talk about is sort of the, the importance of data in relation to this uh, decarbonisation legislation and how that will impact our industry. Um, yes, uh, Graham, thank you very much. Um, yeah, indeed, data, I think, will be very, very important um, going forward. And uh, we will have to ensure that there will be a good exchange between the um, owners and the charters when it comes to data. I think the owners are obliged to um, collect a lot of data at the moment anyhow. So we have, of course, the DCS, the data collecting system, where an owner is, is always obliged to uh, collect all the distance the ship has traveled the amount uh, of fuel which has been consumed and um, the hours the ship has sailed. In addition to that, we have the uh, MRV, which is a European system where basically the same has to be um, collected for ships going to Europe, but also the cargo carrying carried has to be taken in consideration as well. Um, of course, when it comes to charter parties, I think it's always important to um, see who has to do um, um, what. And of course, going through the different clauses, we have different responsibilities. But at the end, um, and I think this is what we also um, agreed on in our clauses from, from the BIMCO perspective, we all agree that the parties will have a much better exchange um, when it comes to data going forward. Um, a lot of data is, is available to, to most parties already now because the owners or the master will have to send daily messages to the charters reporting, you know, how far the ship has traveled, what has been consumed, um, the weather condition, et cetera, et cetera. But nevertheless, at the end, um, the owners will, will have to make a, a roundup of all these information and will have to provide it to the charters. So both parties are actually have the same basis for, for the data which they might need for the decision making. Um. OK, no, thank you, Peter. That, that's fine. Good introduction. Maybe a couple of questions that immediately come to my mind when you start talking about data here. As I say, it's now a very, very valuable commodity in the world. Um, and there's also, you know, you're saying uh, moving forward, we're going to see a better exchange of, of data in the future between owners and charterers, and I guess, you know, between the sort of ship port interface uh, and, and areas like that. So that that suggests that, you know, this overall theme about what needs to change in contracts, it's, are we looking at much more sort of collaborative approach where there's much more sort of a dependency on trust because, you know, who's, who's going to be responsible for this data? Who's going to manage the data? What's the sort of security issues around it? It seems like we're working perhaps in, in a more collaborative way in the future if we now have this greater reliance on data. Um, yes, indeed. I think at the end it will be the, the owner or the, the, the ship itself who has to provide the data because at the end uh, the 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 owner will also have, or the manager will actually have to submit the data um, to have them verified by, by an auditor. In, in a number of cases, this will be um, a class, um, 
um, but it could do, be other verifier. So at the end, I think the, the most the biggest responsibility is with the owner to provide and collect the data, and where necessary, um, provide them to the charters. Um, I'm, I'm personally, I, I think that both parties will work on this in parallel because the charter will have to. Um, especially when it comes to CII, will have to look forward and have to make his own assumptions in uh, looking at the particular ship and at the particular trade, what consumption will, 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 will happen and we'll have to see what kind of scheduling he does for the particular ship, whether this cargo is the right uh, uh, cargo for the ship or whether the next voyage is the right voyage for the ship. So. Um, some part is looking backwards, but I think a very important part will be looking forward into data that you, because you have to um, assume what consumption you will have going forward. So I think this will take a very important role, um, especially as that on the CRI, because it's the operational index and the owner and the charter will probably agree on emissions per nautical miles or consumption per nautical miles, which is quite quite similar. Um, and and uh, eventually a certain target will have to be met. So both parties will have to work very closely together in order to achieve this goal. OK, thanks for that, Peter. And uh, you just mentioned there the issue of sort of uh, consumptions, and then that sort of makes me think of uh, speed and consumption warranties and performance warranties. Do you think the increased available availability of data and more precise data and a greater volume of data coming from ships is likely to change the way we describe our ships. Are we going to move away from, you know, describing a, a ship's performance as, you know, about 14 knots on about X number of tons? Uh, are we going to be sort of now saying, well, OK, you've got all this data. Can we use it much more to, to measure more accurately the performance of, of the ship? Um, actually, not really. I think the data is, is available at the moment as well. You know, everyone can track a ship. I think if you go into the internet, I think it's extremely easy to find out which ship is where, what is the speed of the ship. Um, owners can't hide anything anymore. In the past, you know, if you think, you know, 10, 15 years ago, if a ship had a little breakdown, it was unlikely that a charter could ever find out what happened on a sea voyage. Nowadays, everything is extremely transparent and everyone knows everything immediately. So we sometimes get calls from the charter before the owner might have noticed that the ship has has a delay um, because they can have, have live tracking of the ships. But contractually, I think it makes a difference. Of course, in the past, and, and, and this depends a little bit on, on the area we're active in, you know, um, in the past, usually top speed was was the, the parameter for coming forward in a time charter party. So the top speed and the top consumption would have to be warranted by the owner. And of course, charters were testing that quite often, whether the ship is really um, performing accordingly. If not, you know, a speed or consumption claim would, would be filed. Um, these top speeds are, are, will not be as important anymore as it used to be because, of course, we have the EXI, so we might reduce the top speed but still have a new top speed. But we expect that through the CII, so through, through the operational um, um, requirements, the ship will most likely not run at top speed all the time because if you would do that, you would be missing your target, which could be a B, C or whatever rating it might well be. So the ship will likely um, go slower than in the past. And looking in all contracts, you might not find a reference point for performance of the ship. So if uh, let's take a bulk carrier has 14 knots top speed, she's likely to sail only at 12 knots. So then, of course, it's difficult to challenge whether the ship is still performing according to the charter party or not. So we expect that there will be more or uh, more speeds and, and, and more corresponding consumptions being put into the contract going forward in order to check whether the ship is performing according to contract or not. OK, all right, thanks for that. And then just one last final question that sort of came to mind. Well, the whole issue of data and having more information coming from ships. Um, you know, the industry for, for many years has sort of um, operated with this hurry up and wait type philosophy. Uh, and it, we've dabbled over the past few years with the concept of uh, trying to encourage the industry to do just in time. Um, 
basically, you know, to adjust your speed to your arrive, go straight into the berth, do loader discharging and sail without any sort of large queue sitting out outside ports, which is clearly inefficient. Um, it's never really taken off to the extent we like to see it. But I, I'm wondering if you think, given the combination of we have much more information to share and exchange about the movement of the ship and you know, the availability of ports and berths or whatever, um, and the fact that we now need to have a more efficient industry, it sounds like data would have quite a critical role to play there in encouraging that, perhaps. Indeed, um, but again, I think uh, looking in, in different markets, you see different results. So I think, for example, containers um, adopted very early in in, in uh, basically have an active scheduling of the ship. So you have a liner trade. So, of course, the owner or the, the master knows when he should be at, at a particular port. And, and of course, from an from an from a master's point of view, in order to achieve that, it's always the best to go fast at the beginning, and then slow down to to come to the right arrival arrival date. But this is not very fuel efficient because when you go fast, you use a lot of fuel. If you slow down at the end, you don't save the same amount of fuel you previously um, burned. So I think liner companies adapted very quickly to that, and they make a very active scheduling of the ship. And, and throughout the voyage, they give instructions to the masters how he should perform speed-wise. Dry cargo or tankers and, and other things uh, were slightly different because you have to tender a, 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 a notice when you arrive. And if, if you have a queue for other ships waiting, so it's important when you arrive. So the earlier they arrive, the earlier you can tender your notice of readiness and you go into the queue. So for them, it was more difficult. They always used to go still as fast as they can to the particular port, say I'm arrived, go in a queue and, and, and wait there. I think with BIMCO, we tried to change it with the virtual arrival clause. I think the, the reason for that was maybe a little bit different. This was more that, that Australia didn't want to have too many ships waiting outside their harbors and having a risk for, for you know the Great Barrier Reef or other things. But at the end, this was a virtual arrival concept. And I think this is also basically what we're going to, to, to use here, that ships are slowing down on the voyage in order to arrive at a particular time. And here now we have a, a second layer coming into play that we also have to watch the average consumption of the ship that, that people have to make sure that the ship is not consuming too much. So basically you will perform a slower voyage throughout the voyage rather than have fast patches where you want to, to um, you know, make sure that you're arriving in time and those then slow down. OK, thank you very much indeed for that, Peter. I'm now going to turn to Anne Chazelle, who's the Global Lead Lawyer for Cargill uh, and is another member of our uh, subcommittee working on these carbon clauses. Now, Anne, uh, from what we've been talking about in just a few minutes, I can see as a charterer, we, uh, you're faced with uh, some new uh, challenges here that perhaps uh, as charterer you've never had to face before in terms of operating the ships and, you know, getting the commercial benefit out of them. But somehow now your sort of hands are going to be a little bit more tied for the future. So I guess, how do you see, uh, you know, the, the industry moving forward in terms of the trading of the ship? You've got sort of certain challenges you need to deal with. Um, what's your perspective on this? Well, I think the, my answer to, to the question about what the direction of travel is, is um, it must be increased collaboration between owners and charterers within the industry, because I just don't see otherwise how we are going to achieve what we're being asked to achieve in terms of compliance. Um, I think I think this was foreshadowed really by uh, in the industry's reaction to the 2020 bunker sulphur regulations. I remember in the drafting committee for BIMCO's standard clause for that, there was a there was a recognition that owners and charterers were going to have to talk to each other in order to get through this process, rather than a simple carve up of liability still being um, an appropriate way to deal with it. And, and I think that is very similar to the the, the kind of the times we're facing now and the vibe now um because uh, I, I, yeah i i think unless unless we have that level of communication it's going to be extremely difficult um i mean i think and and this is something we're doing in within cargill at the moment i mean we did it when for the bunker sulfur clauses we were actively reaching out to owners and saying okay 
what are you going to do to comply with this? How are you going to comply? And, and can we help you to comply? Or what can we do to facilitate this? And we're having this same discussion um, with owners now on the EXI clause. We're trying to proactively get in touch with them and saying, OK, you know, what measures are you going to take? What impact is it going to have on the ship's uh, trading pattern? And, and just really figuring out how we can try and do that in a, in a collaborative um, way. Um, and I, I think it varies as well, because I think the EXI's impact on the industry commercially will be really quite limited. I mean, there's no question that owners have to comply and it will cause some short term disruption to ships schedules. But it's already the information that owners and charterers need to figure out what effect the EXI modifications have on their ship um, that information is already out there an owner can already calculate that and so can a relatively sophisticated charterer and, and we find nowadays we're no longer relying on traditional speed and consumption warranties for example largely because ships are not consistently traded at their maximum speed um, but also because we can look at the ship and its its performance now and its performance once the modification has been made and, and we can value that ship. We can work out how much it's worth to us commercially and therefore how much we want to pay for it. So I, I think that is it, it's an impact on the industry, but it's it's relatively limited. CII, I think, is a completely different um, kettle of fish because uh, plainly uh, owners are going to want to have a ship with the best possible CI rating, albeit that, that there isn't really um, a sanction as such for not achieving that rating. At the moment, the sanction is probably going to come from the industry. It's going to come from charterers and their customers and what they're demanding in terms of, of CI rating. Um, and there isn't really the technology out there at the moment to allow ships to comply and maintain a rating other than by going slowly. And that's that's quite a big deal for charters when we're used to having the flexibility to trade the ship pretty much however we want within the contractual framework. Um, and so to be in a situation now where owners are going to be looking to charterers to say, right, it's up to you guys to help us maintain our rating because you're the people who control how the ship is traded. Um, that That's a really fundamental change for charterers who are used to being able to direct the ship to do what they want, which is a function of the underlying sail contract. It's a sail contract for the cargo that's on board the ship that determines usually what we need to do with the ship, whether we need to go faster and, and, and to meet a you know a delivery lacan and um i think be, being asked to to you know limit the way you trade the ship it, it fundamentally that's going to be very difficult for for many charterers and and i'm not quite sure how we're going to navigate that yeah no, thanks for that it's, it's an interesting point because you you mentioning here about the charters essentially have to help the owners maintain the CII rating. Uh, so it's almost like you're, we're at the stage here where you can say, well, the owners can't actually comply with this legislation on their own under time charter because it's, it's the charters that are you know, commercially operating the vessel. And so you do need to work. It's almost like a partnership now, isn't it? It's, it's kind of changing this sort of a contractual landscape in some ways. It's, it's a very different proposition to anything we, we've seen before, that the owners simply can't do this on their own. They, they, they do need the charters to comply. Well, yes, I think I think that's right. I mean, obviously, owners can do their bit in terms of uh, maintaining and operating the, the ship in a way that... Um, that, that, that maintains the rating. They, they have their part to play as well. But it's certainly true that the way the CII fr is framed at the moment, um, an awful lot will depend on the on, on the trading patterns, the way the ship is traded. Um, now, uh, this given, given the way owners and charterers contractual interests, generally speaking, 
diverge completely um, to see them try to collaborate in some way to manage this. I think I think it's very different from the way the industry has traditionally worked. I'm not sure it's within it, it, it's not within the natural thought process of either owners or charters at the moment. Uh, and it, it's going to be really interesting to see how we tackle that. Um, and, and I would say at the moment that their interests in this sort of fundamentally diverge because a, a charter just wants as much freedom to trade as as possible. And 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 owners are saying, well, you know, I, I can't give you that and maintain my vessel rating. So so we'll yeah, we'll see how that goes. I, I think another um actual an, another tension possibly as well is is between the the way trading the, the the environmental aspirations of a lot of the bigger charterers and how that fits in with the realities of of, of trading a ship daily and and I think that there's a you know there's there's a gap there as well which which big traders are going to have to address. Yeah, I think what you're talking about the environmental environmental aspirations of big charters. So I, I was wondering how important is the rating really going to be to charters like Cargill? Um, you, you know, you obviously have to move cargoes, so whatever you you might have a policy that says, well, okay, well, we'll always take C rating or above. But what happens if there aren't any ships available uh, with a C rating or above? Is it going to simply be the case, okay, well, we'll, we'll just have to take what's out there on the market? Or uh, what, what is the solution there when you, you, you have like an environmental policy, but you've got to have some flexibility because you've also got to do business, you've got to move cargoes as well. So I, I just wonder where do you actually sort of stand on on the uh, on the rating issue? Because one of the things I, I you know has been mentioned to me for as an example is this this what they're calling a sort of a, a sister ship syndrome. Because the way the legislation is developed, if you build two identical ships uh, mm -hmm. and launch them, they're both very efficient, a you know a rating or whatever. One is put on a, a trade where there's never any delays in ports, the weather's always brilliant, or whatever, and it keeps its a rating. The other one gets sent on a trade where there are massive port congestion, is always being hit by bad weather, and its rating starts to drop year in year out. But they're otherwise identical; they do everything the same. There is the same efficiency, whatever. And then you're wondering what is the rating really the measure of, and how important is it going to be to you as a charterer? Well, yeah, I think this is a. a this is, in my view, one of the flaws of the uh, the, the whole rating system, because I, and it was one of your colleagues, uh, Grant, who described um, the rating as being, you know, not the, if it, to use his fridge analogy, it's not um, a rating of how intrinsically uh, efficient your fridge is, you know, your A to E rating. It's like having, it, it, it's a measure of how how often you open the fridge door. And and it and it really is. You you can have two, as you say, two assets that are have the same performance. It's purely the way that they've been traded. At which point, you know, if I'm if I'm taking a ship in on charter that has a poor rating purely because of the way she's been traded, in a way, that shouldn't it shouldn't impact my assessment of how efficient that vessel is. So. It, 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 it's very difficult. I mean, I think for a lot of trade charterers, the um, how they look in the rating will depend on what their clients want. So their customers, for example, because if you're a, a container line and your customer is IKEA, then IKEA may have very, very um, strong views about what it will accept. And you as 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 that liner operator will pass those pass those through. Um, so a lot of this, I think, is going to be very, very market driven. Okay, that's interesting. And yeah, this, this is spawning some questions on our chat there. So I think we've uh, hit upon something here. Um, got a question here. Just, you know, this is the real answer. What do we see as the main challenges behind creating a CAI standard clause for chime charter parties? Now, um, you've obviously been involved in working this for many months now, and you know all the things with, uh, with all the big challenges, not all of which we've overcome. But um, maybe you can kind of summarize some of the, the, the challenges that we've, we've faced in trying to put this uh, CII clause for time charter parties together. Well, I, I think partly, you know, technically it, it's quite complicated and the industry hasn't got to grips with the with the technical issues. And certainly in the committee as well, we are having a lot of discussions which where we're dealing with with very, very technical issues about 
uh, about fuel and, and those sorts of things. And um, so I, I think making the clause accessible in a way is is going to be one of the issues. Um, and and the other thing, I mean, it, the fact remains that owners and charterers uh, interests completely diverge. And then it's and but given that you can't make progress on this, as I say, because the technology isn't there, the only thing to do is to go more slowly. Um, it's got, I think, there has to be an impact on charters. And at the moment, it feels from a charterer's perspective that we're being asked to bear all of the burden of this, um, which I'm finding challenging. And it will be interesting to see how the how the industry reacts to the clause. OK, now we've got also comments as well. I mean, the, the, the kind of thrust of the, this webinar and discussions is also aiming towards what do we see in, t in terms of a change of direction and the way the sort of business model for shipping uh, is going to work in the future. Uh, there's a comment here from Neil Henderson saying that one way of reducing carbon intensity is to reduce long re repositioning passages in ballast. Are we potentially going to see a new type of time charter whereby two charters share a vessel for the respective cargoes or other types of new chartering arrangements? So, yeah, I guess it's the thing. Are we looking at a new model, uh, a business model for the way business is going to be done in the long term? I, I think it's possible. I mean, we already see parceling, right, which is kind of a part of that. Um, I, I, th I think looking at a kind of just in time system for the dry bulk industry as well is 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 very interesting. I appreciate it's not something that's taken off previously, but again, the, that must be something that's that's worth exploring. And yeah, I, I guess it will be. It will be a question of. Um, the energy that's been put previously into how we make money on freight, how we make money on how we position vessels, if some of that energy now goes into, well, what sort of collaborations can we can we achieve with other with other stakeholders to try to find ways that are environmentally efficient to trade those ships? Um, I think there's a lot of creative industry in the way, sorry, a creative energy in the way ships are traded. And, and I'm sure some of that can be harnessed and directed to these kinds of issues. Yeah, and I, I think this point here, you just touched upon there about the, the relationship uh, between owners and charters in the future is perhaps going to change. Uh, you know, we mentioned the word partnership, whatever. And Miriam Goldby's picked up on this uh, and is saying, you know, do you think these new realities will or should have an impact on the way charter party contracts are interpreted by the courts? Should they be treated as relational contracts with implication of good faith terms necessary for the contract's uh, business efficiency in the light of the need for collaboration? So. Again, we, we're looking at the, 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 the relationship, the contractual relationship seems to be taking a new direction. And, and what impact does that like to have legally? Uh, well, it may do. I mean, my personal view is, is that the English courts are still going to be fairly slow to automatically impute a, a duty of good faith in, in maritime contracts. But um, it's an interesting question. We'll see. It, it's, I guess it's certainly possible. Okay. Um, right. Thank you very much indeed for that. There was a, there's been a sort of few comments backwards and forwards about the uh, the comment that, that Neil made on ballast voyages, um, and I, I think what's been uh, picked up in here by people in our audience is is that we also have this rather strange concept under CI that by taking longer voyages, you can actually improve your CI rating, which seems a bit uh, contradictory, but th th that actually seems to be the case. You can actually take a longer voyage, you can reduce cargo, reduce speed. These are all ways of improving your CI rating. It doesn't necessarily seem to uh, improve emissions for the shipping industry generally uh, by, by doing this sort of things, but that's just the way the legislation is being constructed. So it, it, although it seems a bit odd, it is actually one way of doing it by actually taking a, a longer voyage uh, rather than a shorter one to improve your CI. So good. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that, Anne. I'm now going to move over to Tristan. Uh, Tristan is Associate Professor at UCL Energy Institute. Uh, and Tristan, you are going to be challenged with the task of answering the question about um, the general direction of travel in the contractual and commercial realms in the terms of misalignment of incentives for owners and charterers. Thanks, Grant. And I'll just connect on to your, your recent point. Um, sorry, please don't, don't take this the wrong way, but I 
acutely remember the moment, I spent a lot of time at the IMO, I remember the moment when BIMCO intervened to argue why the data collection system of the IMO shouldn't include cargo mass because of confidentiality risk. And that's why we have AR and not EEOI, which would not create the perverse unintended consequence that we were just discussing. Um, so it's really, I mean, it's so interesting and so complicated to get these things right. And the confidentiality, ar confidentiality argument is certainly very valid, but it shows how difficult it is to do the right thing in legislation sometimes. So we, we come to this subject from the, um, mm. the perspective of um, market barriers and failures, and that's where we started looking at this. And I think that's just a pretentious way to say exactly what your previous two speakers have explained. Um, we know that the shipping industry has misaligned incentives. There's an asset owner who carries the capital cost of investing in the technical efficiency of an asset, and then a charterer who makes operational decisions which create different fuel consumption. And uh, the ability of the asset owner to make technology investment and be rewarded it or rewarded on it is dependent on the market valuing the efficiency of the vessel. And we've historically spent a lot of time doing sort of economic econometric analyses in order to explore whether or not the more efficient vessel in a particular subset, the Campsomax or the Panamax or whatever, does genuinely get a higher price. And in most market conditions, the answer mm -hmm. is it doesn't. It's being rewarded by a very small premium, um, but something certainly nothing like the value in fuel saving to the charterer. And um, that's really interesting because that market failure is why we then started to see some of the private standards appear, things like the sea cargo chart and the Poseidon principles that attempt to address these misalignments. So we've talked primarily about the owner charter of misalignment, but there's obviously still some that occur between ports and that's why the kind of um, virtual arrival and the hurry up and wait um, dynamic comes from because the incentives and, and the benefits are not shared equally between those two stakeholder groups. The financiers have risks that don't necessarily flow through in the same way. So, so there is all of that. That's why some we saw some private standards est established. That's also why we then saw policy intervention, because this isn't just about the fact that the industry isn't as economically efficient as it could be if some of those um, transaction shortcomings or market barriers and failures had been addressed. This is also because we're in the context of needing to decarbonize the fleet and we're in the context of needing to decarbonize it incredibly rapidly. We basically have two decades to substitute two or three hundred million tons of fossil fuel to something different. And the most uh, the least cost way of doing that is to do as much energy efficiency this decade in order to reduce the volume of new energy and um, fleet that you then need to be retrofitting and modifying as we go into the 2030s. So there's a there's a regulatory logic uh, which helps to explain why CII and EEDI um, have, have all come about, which is let's get some efficiency into the fleet because we know it's not as efficient as it could be because we know it's beset by these um, archaic contracting relationships which create all the market barriers and failures. Um, but what that has done is now created the landscape that you articulated in the opening remarks, which is this kind of puzzle of, well, we have some rapidly evolving policy. Some of it is quite innovative, but we also have on top of the ones that you mentioned, a lot of policy waiting in the wings, which is going to come. Um, the fuel EU uh, legislation, the midterm measures at the IMO. And as that comes, that will probably enter into the re regulatory space um, within the timescales of time charters that are being negotiated today. And so and so there's a problem that uh, anyone operating in the value chain of shipping is going to need to manage, which is how do we how do we um, manage the policy uncertainty, the fact that we have some information and but really not as much as one would need in order to make really clear um, contracts. And then the other part of it is the technology uncertainty. So I would I would slightly disagree with the framing given by Anne where the only thing you can do is reduce speed. I mean, we know that there is a differential in the technical efficiency of ships in the fleet today. Um, there are things that can be done to the ship, but most often at the moment they're not made because there isn't this um, trade off between the choices and the decisions that the owner has control of and the choices of the decisions that the charter has control of. And so um, uh, that's going to be a very minor version of what is going to happen in the next couple of years as serious investment into alternative fuels, not LNG, but zero emission fuels starts to happen. And the and the optionalities about how do I get my CII down? Is it 
just by going half not slower? Is it by sticking wind assistance on or is it because I'm going to run a 50 percent biofuel or something? And all of those optionalities will play into the contracting in a much more complicated way than we can and we have been used to because it's not just about speed and consumption anymore. So there's a policy uncertainty. When is UK EU ETS going to clarify? When is um, the IMO's equivalent is going to clarify? Uh, when is the IMO going to adopt life cycle guidelines that give you the ability to see that a biofuel would reduce your emissions? Um, all, all of that, all of those uncertainties mean that the contracting, I think, has to move to a different regime where the risks and opportunities created by that complexity and uncertainty are managed in a different way. And I hope shared more kind of fairly between the different stakeholders. Um, I think that is is very similar to the points that have been made earlier, because one element of that management of risk and opportunity is better data, and the other element of it is better conversation. And so I really liked what Anne was saying about um, what CII is creating is a conversation, which is exactly what it needed to create. So if it doesn't achieve anything else, but the parties talk to each other, which is kind of what's happened with um, the private standards equivalent of CII, like C cargo charter and and uh, sign principles, then I think that's a huge step forwards for the sector. And um, whether or not we can then convert it into something that has all the kind of legal uh, liability framing that can really help you to manage those in a more classical way on top of that conversation, I hope that will come too. And I'm sure there are some very skilled lawyers uh, on this call who can help to figure that out. So um, I think those that's where I wanted to kind of leave my message, sharing risk, op risk and opportunity, um, but very much reinforcing what those previous speakers had said on data and conversation. All right, thank you very much indeed, Tristan, for that. Uh, you mentioned there uh, in your presentation that you know we've got two decades to substitute and it should be industry's reliance on fossil fuel fuel. So it, it does require uh, a significant change to the fleet. Uh, that doesn't happen overnight. Are you kind of uh, comfortable that the IMO would actually be able to meet its emissions reductions targets? That's going to be wholly dependent in some ways on you know the ship owning uh, companies replacing their, their ships or replacing the technology or replacing the fuels on the on, on their ships in a sufficiently short period of time because with the way it seems at the moment how we, we've talked you know in the early part of this webinar is that the the reduction methods are essentially seem to be based on reducing speed in some way but you just can't keep reducing speed at some point you have to do something else and of course you've mentioned energy saving devices and other innovations and we should certainly be encouraging innovation in the shipping industry but without very obvious incentives, is that going to happen, do you think? Or do we need to rethink, you know, is this meant to be some sort of a sharing of the costs amongst owners and charters in order to encourage uh, you know, more efficient ships and new innovations to help reduce emissions? I don't think so. I, I do think it's going to happen. It's completely inevitable. IMO's members and, you know, a third of them are existentially um, challenged once the temperature rise exceeds 1.5 degrees, which it probably will do by the end of this decade. So we're on a pathway where the governments that make this, the decisions you're referring to are, are going to increasingly have no choice but to put incredibly strong policy incentive in place. Now that, that isn't gonna happen next year, unfortunately, it's not gonna clarify anything next year, but it will only get stronger and stronger. The worst case scenario for the industry is if it takes a very drawn out period of time and you know, in five, six, seven years time, it's only clarifying then, then the industry will only have a decade in which to achieve an incredibly disruptive transition. But I don't think, I don't think we should look to the IMO on this, to be honest. I think you should look much more widely at what's happening at the um, plurilateral or the um, national and regional level. Uh, what the EU is doing is one example, but the, the initiative mm. of the Clyde Bank Declaration launched by the UK government at COP26 is about stimulating first uh, movers and early adopters on um, the kind of niche routes on which you can already start to operate with, with the future fuels, the scalable fuel solutions, which are what you really need. So I completely agree with your point, Grant, that we can't do this with speed. We can't do this with just tweaking the efficiency of the ships. This is a fuel transition. Um, or we'll, the problem is that the regulations that we have at the moment are primarily about efficiency. So that's why the framing of this discussion has been about that. But believe me, the, the, the fuel transition regulation that will push out fossil fuels is what's in development at the moment and will come and cause far more disruption to, than, to the sector than, than the efficiency regulation. Um, so the, the, the framing of things like uh, national government action, 
but also what's happening in the finance and the insurance and the charter community. Um, the science-based targets initiatives, I don't know if members of this call have come across those, those will launch for shipping next month and are a kind of corporate framework where any organisation that has scope three emissions will need to find a way to get its um, upstream emissions, sorry, it's not its upstream, it's, it's non-operational emissions controlled. That's what's driving companies like Apple, Unilever, um, Amazon, um, Ikea to commit to having only zero emission ships operating from 2040 onwards, make those statements very publicly and find ways to do the partnerships with those who are owning and operating vessels that are on that pathway. So that drives investment today. So does the mass hydrogen investment movement into the supply chain of the new fuels. Those two things happen outside of the the IMO's energy efficiency regulation, they happen regardless of what IMO does next, but you won't be able to ensure finance or charter a ship by probably 2030 unless it's on its way to a zero emission pathway if it isn't there already. Okay, thank you for that, Tristan. We've got a, a question that's come in from uh, Harris Sugrafakis, uh, and Harris is asking, uh, the IMO trajectory to 50% reduction by 2050 is, of course, behind the curve compared to the commitments of both states and companies. Are we not making the same error by focusing on CII when the supply chain is far more ambitious and has adopted EEOI type metrics in scope three towards zero or net zero by 2050? Yes, I think Harris has helped me there because that was in some ways my point. You know, I think we can obsess about the IMO regulation and I understand why why people do look at that. But the the IMO is not is not moving as fast as some of the other framing that is so important commercially and uh, as Harris is referring to. And so I think obviously you need to make sure that the, the CII um, obligation is covered. But in our analysis, the CII obligation is pretty small and it won't be difficult for um, you know, the vast majority of globally trading ships to meet that. So then what will happen is organisations that are um, sort of left behind because the IMO regulation doesn't manage their climate risk or their obligation to shareholders or their market positioning to customers, because the IMO regulation doesn't enable them to meet that, they will just increasingly take over and the IMO will increasingly lose re relevance as we go through this early stage. Now, I think the IMO will then probably catch up because it'll just, you know, it'll, it will catch up with, with where we need to be, but it just won't move as fast as many parts of the private sector are already moving. So I think you have to do both, um, but just make sure you're not, you're not obsessed on the CII when there's so many other things that drive these things. Sure, okay. All right, thank you very much indeed for that, Tristan. So now we're gonna to turn to our, uh fourth speaker of today, Rachel, who's uh, stepping in for uh, Beth, who couldn't make it today. Um, as you, Rachel introduced herself earlier on, so I don't need to do that again. Uh, but Rachel, you've heard all of these things that are all pointing, I, I, I would suggest, to the fact that we need to look at our contracts in, in quite a significant way. Um, what is the way forward for contracts and, and clauses uh, governing our industry in the light of all this new legislation? I think that's absolutely right, Grant. Um, and you know, I come to the topic from the perspective of someone who is advising on regulation. And interestingly, in this realm, as you and Tristan have just discussed, advising also on many non-regulatory initiatives because they are actually very relevant in driving change. Um, and once the parties are aware of what those initiatives are and where that might lead them and what the commercial opportunities and risks are, we then get down to the business of dealing with the contract and trying to change the contract to accommodate new uh, the new regulations and the new issues. Now, uh, uh, I guess the privilege of coming last in this roster of speakers <laughs> is that the speakers who've gone before me have uh, really set out what the territory is. And it's no surprise, I think, if I say that the summary of that when we come to look at the contract is that the unifying theme of all of these different initiatives and regulations is vessel efficiency. So that's increasingly um, becoming the overriding concern and the contract needs to pivot towards that to accommodate that. Because when we look at the charter party and the existing charter party regime, which has been in play for uh, a long, long time, it doesn't very well fit that. So we've spoken quite a bit about speed uh, and just-in-time arrivals. 
the obligations in the contract which are driving that scenario where vessels are going as quickly as they can to arrive early to tender NOR, uh, to then sit and wait outside of a port, usually running their auxiliary engines to power the ship. Whereas if they uh, took a different, if a different approach was taken, there'd be a reduction in emissions. It's the obligations in the contract, it's the contractual mechanism which sets up the structure for that to be the way in which the parties operate. So that's what we need to start to undo really, so that um, with more communication, vessels can be approaching, whether someone made the point earlier, uh, that it's no point rushing and then slowing down at the very end of the voyage. It's more about synchronizing uh, the incoming of the vessel over a much longer period of time so that you really gain those emissions benefits. Now, we can, when we come to look at the contract, we can bolt on clauses that deal with these issues or we can tweak what's there already. But that, to my mind, is not the most effective way of dealing with what is a major transition in the way that the parties are relating to one another. Now, I think a lot of people on the call will probably be familiar with the reality of dealing with a charter party, which is that you don't have a contract that you know, begins at the beginning and is signed by both parties at the end, and all of the clauses exist once effectively. Uh, the reality of dealing with a charter party is that you usually have some kind of standard form that's been amended, that's further amended by comments in the fixture recap, and the fixture recap usually imposes rider clauses particular to one or both of the parties. So when you come to interpret a charter party, you're usually going to five or six different versions of the same clauses or clauses that deal with the same issues. So when you come to look at something like speed and performance, you're not just looking at a back-to-back -back series of amendments that flow through this negotiation process that give you a clear picture of what speed and performance is so that then you can tweak it a little bit. What you often end up with is a bit of a kaleidoscope of provisions and you're trying to interpret those best possible. Now, this of course is fertile ground for shipping lawyers. Um, and I wouldn't want to do us out of a job by saying we could do a little bit better from the beginning. But I think the reality is that when you have that kaleidoscope of different rider clauses, fixture recap and amended standard form, if you're making a fairly radical change, a way to make it is perhaps to cut through those different versions and to do something a bit closer to not exactly starting again, but looking at what the underlying regime is, things like the due dispatch obligation. Is that really the right, uh, the right framework and the right uh, driving factor for the charter party in an environment where vessel efficiency is becoming the overriding concern. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do, I guess, when I come to supporting the parties on uh, turning all of these issues into clauses in the charter party. But there's there's a an issue that we bump up against here and someone raised it earlier, I think it might have been Anne, which was the gap between corporate aspiration and day-to-day -day, um, operations. So whilst I think what I see from my perspective is that entities are quite often aware that they need to begin to think about performing their operations in a bit of a different way. But in the thick of doing business day in, day out, there's not a lot of breathing space necessarily to step away from the way that things have been done for a long time and to be accepting and accommodating of, well, here's a different version of the charter party. Here's something that looks different. Here are some different clauses. And that might go to the point that you made about there not being great uptake of the just-in-time arrival clauses, the virtual NOR clauses, etc. Because it takes a little bit of a shift in mindset that perhaps it, there's a challenge in that filtering down from the level of corporate aspiration to the fixing of charter parties day in, day out and the trading of business. So I think to summarise my answer to the question, what's the general direction of travel? I think we are headed towards a fairly radical revisioning of the charter party. And I think that's to the benefit of both owners and charterers because it gives a more relevant, up-to-date footing to that relationship, but we do face some challenges in getting there. 
Grant, you'll just need to unmute your mic. Thank you for telling me so quickly. I could have gone on for minutes before anyone said anything. So. <laughs> um, it's a good point. You're right. You talked about revisioning of charter parties. Is it revisioning or is it completely rethinking? I'm kind of conscious at BIMCO, I think, you know, the past 10 years or so, we produce a lot of additional clauses to address topical issues, whether it's slow steaming vertical arrival, uh, how cleaning or whatever. And sometimes it seems what we're doing is papering over the cracks in charter parties that were written a very, very long time ago and simply either don't deal with these issues or deal with them in a way that we want to overturn that principle because it's no longer doesn't resonate with modern shipping in some ways. We need to address that. So it's this fact, do, do we now need to think of a completely brand new type of charter party, a kind of fourth way of doing things that starts from scratch, not not sort of takes bits and pieces and, you know, from older charter parties and, and tries to sort of get rid of the things that don't work anymore and introduce new things, but a, a kind of rethinking of the whole thing. And then you were mentioning the concept of mindset as well in the industry. And we know there are certain sectors of our industry um, that are conservative, that are ultra conservative to change. They they will they will simply carry on using their 1922 Gen Cons and their 1946 NYPEs. Um, they they like them, they're familiar with them, they know all the judgments have been done on the wording and everything. Trying to dislodge that in itself and say, okay, well, here's a new way of doing business, that in itself is quite a big challenge. So how do we address that? How do, how do we move forward and achieve this? Well, that's a great question, and I, I wish I had the answer. <laughs> Uh, when it comes to rethinking the contract, I think you're right. I mean, we'll never we'll never begin with charter parties in a vacuum because of everything that's gone before. So I don't think we will ever sit down with a blank piece of paper and ask ourselves what should be in a charter party because there's just too much history to move away from that. But I think we could start to piece together a new charter party out of what we know works and what we know needs to be different. And I think that that if it existed, would be an important tool in coming to the second part of your question, starting to change the mindset, because if there's some uptake around a new way of doing things and that's successful and that enables the parties to meet their objectives, well, then that starts to bridge the gap of hesitancy. And I think there will be a lot of parties watching and waiting to see who are going to be the first movers. And this brings us on to, I think, where will the parties have a competitive advantage if they are able to collaborate and go through this process of revising and rewriting their charter parties over the parties which are still kind of clinging to the way that they've done business for a long time. Personally, and I'm interested to hear the views of other people on the panel, but personally, I think, yes, there is a competitive advantage to be gained from taking a bit of a stride into a new realm when it comes to the format and the mechanism of the contract. OK, thanks for that, Rachel. Just pick up a couple of things that appeared in the chat here. So I've got a good point here from Jeffrey Bloom here. Um, we were talking about the virtual arrival uh, thing as well. I mean, that that is, as Jeffrey points out, has been you know talked about in the industry for a long, long time. He says 10 years. I think it goes further back than that. I remember BP shipping coming up with the concept of virtual arrival a long time ago. It didn't really take off. Uh, we've had several attempts at sort of you know repackaging it and saying to the industry okay this is this is you know the, the way to move forward and we've never been able to perhaps get the right incentives in there or we've never been able to find parties who can involve all of the stakeholders necessary to make this work and how was the incentivizing that thing um so if now all we're saying in terms of encouraging just-in-time arrivals is to say that it's to do with climate change is that enough for it to work or should we be think of some other change in attitude to encourage people to move down this just in time route. I think the shift is coming from a number of different directions now that probably didn't exist before when this was first being tabled. So one, there's the regulatory push. Now we're well aware that the standard of ambition and regulation isn't really enough to shift shipping to be on a trajectory for decarbonisation at a sufficiently swift rate. But what we also have is the um, desire from end users from uh, of the shipping chain to reduce emissions. So and, and that's new. That didn't exist at that time. So I think 
where say just in time and virtual arrivals existed but maybe the climate for it to be accepted and desirable hadn't quite formed that has now formed and there's now a lot of incentives you know we're talking about uh, Tristan's mentioned quite a few you know, new bits of policy there's also the uh, initiatives like Sea Cargo Charter, Poseidon Principles there's so much more visibility so much more data as Peter's spoken to around efficiency that there's there's really an environment in which this becomes not just necessary, but also very desirable because uh, those who can operate in a more efficient way, they're going to be able to position themselves to uh, gain greater reward and uh, I, th I think take the competitive advantage. OK, thanks for that, Rachel. Um, I'm going to put the kind of the big question about the business model and is it going to change you to the rest of the panel in a second. Uh, I see there's a question in, in here, uh, yeah, which I can imagine actually, it says, is BIMCO planning to draft clauses to this effect for incorporation to both time and voyage charter parties? The answer is yes, we are actually actively working on that at the moment. We have already published an EEXI clause that's already out there that's, and that's available. Uh, we've produced uh, an ETS clause as well, which is pending adoption, hopefully in May uh, and we are working as hard as we possibly can on developing a CII compliance clause for time charter parties. Once these three time charter party clauses are out there we will then focus on other charter party types like a voyage charter party um, and also ship management agreements etc. So we're going to go through the whole suite and range of contracts and see what needs to be addressed in there but yes we are working on them and they will be available as soon as they're finished so that's my advert over there and I also see a comment there suggesting that are also Suitable clauses available from the Chancery Lane project. So there's a, a quick plug for them as well. If you want to look to see what, what they've come up with on, on this issue as well. It's good that uh, lots of people are looking to address this this issue. So, uh, Rachel, thank you for that. I'm just going to put in the same question. I'm going to start with Peter now. Um, and Peter, what, what's your views on, you know, are we moving towards a brand new model of doing business in the industry? Is there a, a new type of charter party that's needed to make this new relationship, this new world order operate more efficiently? And it's time to sort of put the old time charters behind us and come up with another solution? Actually, um, I, I don't think so. I think the charter parties as we have them can cater quite well for things we need now. Um, basically, it's also the same for, for the ships. I think the ships in general are not... Um, they, they're partly the problem um, because uh, quite often you have older ships, like with an old car. You know, you have an old car, it might have a big engine. So what do you do with your car? Of course, you can try to play around and put in new tires which have less resistance and you save a little bit of fuel. You might put a spoiler on there because you think, you know, it might run a little bit better with, with, with less resistance when it comes to comes to airflow. But at the end, the, the car is a car. And the question how you drive the car clearly tells you what is your average consumption. So if you go full speed, you will have a very high consumption. If you go on a traffic jam and always try to speed up and, and catch up, you will have a very high consumption. If you go on the M25 and do your whatever, 80K in average, you probably have a really decent consumption. Maybe not as good as a new car, but not completely out of gorge, I guess. So I think the same as with the, with the charter party contracts. I think... At the end, and I think what, what Rachel said is absolutely right, who wants this? So if the cargo wants that the cargo is being transported with low emissions, they might have to pay for that. If they want that, I think the charter will do it. And once the charter will do it, the owner will do it one way or the other because the owner will just follow the order of the charters. So uh, living away the, the, the aspect of how good or how bad the ship is. Um, um, at the moment, we have a situation that the regulations probably want this more than the cargo owner or at least the charter. And I think this is where we have the conflict. And I think Anne rightly said at the moment, you know, and a trader just calculates what is the best return on the voyage. So he knows how the cost of the ship, he knows the cost of the bunker, and then he works out what is the best voyage. Do I go fast or do I go slow? At the moment, he's not considering emissions. So now we have a new threshold which comes into play. It's the emissions. So and the question is, is the trader willing to calculate in, to factor in the emissions, and does he get paid for that? At the, at, at the moment, there might be some cargo owners who say, yes, I, I want this. I might be willing to pay 
more for for having the car the cargo shipped at a lower speed or let's call it less 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 emissions but a lot of maybe they they don't really mind so and this is where we have the contra uh, conflict because i can't see any terms of the charter party in conflict of going slower there's none the charter can order the ship at the speed provided you have a slow sleeping clause etc cetera, etc cetera. and you don't have issues with a bit of lading etc but in principle i think the charter can order the ship at a speed they want they can load the type of cargo the quantity of cargo they can do everything themselves they don't need the owner for that of course the ship has to be maintained in a decent way so there should be no marine growth on it engine should be be maintained in a proper way i think this is this is this is all clear but i think it's really from that context it really comes from my point of view from the cargo owners and from the regulations i think the charter party can very well cater for that because i don't see any conflicts of that it's only if people try to say but i don't want that and of course at the moment the regulations focusing on the owner that the owner has to comply with it not the charter and we're trying to pass it on i think this is the conflict we're having all right, thanks for that, Peter. And you've heard what Peter's going to say. He believes that the uh, existing charter party regimes are fit for purpose and do what they're meant to do. Um, but of course, you yourself pointed out earlier on that here we are trying to create a regime that passes a lot more onto the charterers than perhaps you're comfortable with. So is it time for a new type of contract? That's better. I think any change is going to be evolutionary rather than revolutionary and I think that's largely for the reasons that that Rachel has highlighted uh it's we do work in a very very conservative industry um and I and I think it, it's not only the owners perhaps or, or the charterers who are who are conservative it, it's also we lawyers right because if we have we're working off forms of wording that in some cases have been there for more than 100 years and we as lawyers are confident that we know what that means and and that we can advise our clients accordingly and that's very important to us so before anyone starts sort of toying with that i think i think there is you know any, anyone who would to sit down and write a charter party from scratch would be a a, a, a very very brave draftsman indeed um but so as I say, so I think we're looking at a, a, a gradual evolution, and and this is in an industry where we still see the NYP P, NYP form with its reference to donkey boilers used in preference to countless more modern charter passes. But I'm sure there is space there for it, for this to develop. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Yeah, and I think it might be also uh, refers to best West Welsh coal for bunkers as well, which is something that needs to be scratched out very quickly. Uh, Tristan, if I could turn to you now, you're, you're a man that looks sort of a scoping future scenarios. How do you see this this playing out in the future in terms of business models? Uh, yeah, I'll take the business model rather than the chartering. I, like, I, I sit in an ivory tower, obviously, and, and don't see the coal face in, that, that so many of the of, of the members of the audience and, and the panel see. But I, the thing that strikes me is that we um, we have a sector which is, is in very few cases vertically integrated. The companies that will be able to manage this decade and the massive turbulence that's coming um, is are those that that can that can either manage the, the risk and the opportunity and the contracting and remain kind of in a very siloed structure that we have at the moment or those who become more vertically integrated and are able to actually internally manage the the risk and opportunity and we can see examples of that already you can see what Maersk are doing buying up logistics um, investing very heavily in the fuel supply chain you can see what's happening with companies like Itoshu, Cargill, Trafigura these are all companies that have massive control of shipping operations and ownership in the classical like time charter, voyage charter, trip charter world but but are moving into the into the space where they will be able to vertically integrate and and take business opportunity and market share. And uh, I think it'll be quite brutal for people who aren't able to do that. All right, thank you very much indeed to that, Tristan. And, and thank you to you all for, I think was, well, it's been quite a well-rounded uh, discussion here, looking at many different aspects and perspectives on this. I'm gonna hand you back to Rachel now for the wrap. I don't have any more questions in here, my little chat thing. So uh, Rachel, over to you. 
Oh, thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Tristan and Peter and Grant. It's been wonderful to be a part of this conversation with you all. And I think we've given the issues a good airing and uh, taken a number of perspectives on them. Thank you, everybody who has joined us online. Uh, interested to hear in follow up any uh, thoughts, etc., that you might wish to share with us. It just leaves me uh, now to thank very much uh, Hill Dickinson and also the London Shipping Law Centre for bringing together and hosting this event and to wish you all a very good rest of the day. Thank you and goodbye.